what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. to uh, when I saw on the board uh, one of the points that were raised by this particular congregation pray for South Africa of course you've got the issue of the high unemployment rate high crime statistics the fact that there's need for betterment economic empowerment and so on and that's something which is close to me and dear to my heart um, in a sense if both Muslims and Christians could come together on that formal essential level and of course taking into account that there might be theological differences which might, of course, separate us, but the common humanity that exists between two major faiths. At the outset, I'd like to state that you find both Islam and Christianity are moral religions. In other words, they define God-human relationships in terms of uh, moral rather than cultic or Gnostic terms. Both have a common prophetic heritage. You find there's a God-centered vision and a, a common goal of what some would call establishing the kingdom of God on earth. But in both religions, you find that doctrinal assertions about the nature of God, the nature and, uh, in a sense, the mission of the religious apostles, they in fact form the, the, the form of worship that are basically the divergence. It's essentially become the main dividing line between these major faiths. When you look at the term Islam itself and the term Muslim, and it's something which I emphasize on, in fact, a regular basis, is that the term Islam and Muslim must not be viewed in a historically circumscribed significance in terms of how one would place it in the conventional framework of world religions. You find at its particular root level, the word simply means peace acquired through the submission to the will of God. Now in the Quran itself you find a reference in chapter 3 verse, uh, I believe it's uh, verse 49, where Jesus in fact asks his disciples, his Ansar, who will be my helpers, and they proclaim that we do submit that we will in fact put forth our assistance to you in aiding you on your specific mission and bear thou witness that we are submitting ourselves to the will of God. One word describing that specific quality in the Arabic language is Islam. When you look at the common prophetic heritage and specifically the message in history, the first of all commandments, which I mention quite often in Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 6 verse 4, the Shema, Shema Israelu adna ila haynu adna ikhan, which means here O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A thousand years later when the same question is posed to Jesus, peace be upon him, in respect of the first of all commandments. He repeats identically, word for word, what Moses had said a thousand years before, which was, Shama Israelu adnai lahaynu adnai echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Some 600 years later, you find a Christian deputation in Najran comes to the Prophet Muhammad in Medina. They spend three days in the mosque, they sleep in the mosque, they eat in the mosque, and they even pray in the mosque. And at a particular interval, they question him, what was his concept of God? And he was made to say, Kul Wallahu Ahad, say he is God, the one and only. Now the point is, 
the commonality between these two particular words, ahad in Arabic and ikhad in Hebrew, linguistically meaning one and the same, implies that there is a common message, a universal message. As the Quran says, And there never was a people without a warner having lived amongst them. Again, And to every nation did we send a guide. The argument is that if the Almighty is not partial in respect of his material blessings, in respect of his food, his shelter, why then should he be partial in respect of his spirituality? He has not been partial. And so in the broader sense, we say that that original message that was vouchsafed to men through means of revelation was one. It was the same message from time eternal, from time immemorial. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was about to leave the earth, he informed his disciples, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, shall come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things ever shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he will declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. Now you analyze history. You analyze the different religious faiths of the world. Islam happens to be, again, the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to accept the historical personage of Jesus. No Muslim, in a manner of speaking, can technically be described as a Muslim if he does not accept the prophetic message and ministry of Jesus uh, Christ, peace be upon him. So there is this commonality. The Quran says, O people of the book, Yahla Kitab, Ta'ala, come. Ila Kalimatin Sawaim Bainana wa Bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. That we worship none but one God. That we associate no partners with him. And that we take not from amongst ourselves lords and patrons other than God. If they turn back, then bear witness that we are submitting ourselves to the will of God. We are Muslims. So we say, by implication, Abraham was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. Adam was a Muslim. David were Muslims. In that broad universal sense in terms of which these particular phrases refer to. As states of beings. Being in the will of submission to the will of the Almighty. As opposed to religion in the conventional sense of the term. And of course that would obviously mean that even the terms Christianity and the terms Judaism or the terms Hinduism would be viewed as something which is a construct, a historical construct arising out of a particular context. Now, I had suggested again that, you know, when I was speaking to Dr. Prophet, it's just that's why I'm so a bit perturbed and sad that I would have loved to have had the entire congregation here. We are, we're not here to preach or basically score points against each other in any manner of speaking. But I think that there are, there are certain points of divergence which keep us apart. And I'd like to focus on that. The first thing is that as far as the whole issue of interfaith dialogue is concerned, as far as the reasons in the world today why Muslims distrust Christians, there are three fundamental reasons for the Muslim distrust of Christianity. One is what we would describe as the theological mistrust. The other is the experiential mistrust. And thirdly, we have what we call the academic mistrust. Theologically, you find that the mistrust is based upon two components. One is the first of which revolves around, if I may put it, that Christianity or conventional Christianity in today's parlance has in a sense been transformed, and I say this with respect, into a kind of a, into the cult of Jesus. In other words, the Islamic viewpoint of Jesus as opposed to the Christian viewpoint of Jesus is that Jesus was a mighty messenger of God. In Surah 19 verse 33, of course I do not have time to go into the chapter, but effectively to paraphrase the contents, what Jesus is made to say is, I am a servant of God, he has vouchsafed me revelation and has made me a prophet, and made me blessed wherever I might be, and has enjoyed upon me prayer and charity as long as I live. Now as a long history of the nature of the debate of Jesus uh, is concerned, Christian understanding, and when I speak about Christian understanding, I'm talking about mainstream biblical scholarship. You look at the two big school, you look at the scholarships of Julius Wellhausen, uh, people like Shauna Struck and so on, uh, even people such as Hans Kung, is that 
Albert Schweitzer in his book In Quest for the Historical Jesus is that the Christian understanding of who Jesus is is not that simple. In other words, there is no commonality across the board. In fact, if you look at recent um, writings, um, writings of people such as John Hick, uh, uh, Richard Elliot Friedman from Harvard Divinity School, um, John Hick and recent biblical investigations such as uh, the book The Myth of God Incarnate shows that Jesus himself certainly understood himself as a prophet with a mission to communicate the message of God and to reform society at a broader specific level. And that, in a sense, the term even Messiah and the term Son of God, of course, that's another debate in itself, but these titles, in fact, reflect uh, the, church's, the church's later attempts at exegesis. In other words, efforts to give significance to the personality of Jesus for human history. If you look at the terms Son of God and the terms Messiah in the context of the Old and the New Testament, they were not unique terms. Of course, we don't have time to discuss that. You read the expression, uh, for as blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In other words, used as an expression in terms of a common uh, designation for a prophet who was a vouchsafed revelation in a broader sense of the word. If one to look, for example, even at um, common references, you look at the Gospel of John for that matter, which many modern biblical scholars dated to about 100 AD, and they put forth or promulgate that the Gospel of John has a great degree of Alexandrian Gnosticism, which is attached to it, especially the first chapter. For example, the common um, uh, expression in the New Testament in John 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God uh, amongst certain fundamentalist groups would state this is basically an indication of the divinity of Christ yet even if you look at the Greek itself and if you can just forgive my pronunciation in the Greek the actual word is en archi en di logos kai di logos en prostontheon kai theos en di logos if, I, if I've got it correct, forgive so my... It's pretty close. <laughs> if it's pretty close. But the point is that the words, en proston theon, kai theos, the word for God in the first instance, referring to God Almighty, is second in context to the um, word for God as it's used for the word. And this is what many biblical scholars, in fact, if you look at the writings of um, Edgar Goodspeed and J.M. Power Smith, where they translated the New Testament and the American translation, you look at the uh, common uh, lexicons, uh, uh, the works of James Moffat, for example, even the Kingdom Interlinea, the New World Translation, and the translations of many biblical scholars they would put forth, and this is no indication of the divinity. In other words, those verses which have commonly been construed to refer to the divinity of Christ. Of course, that's another debate in itself, but obviously as a passing reference. So in conclusion on that specific point, Charles Kammer, a Christian commentator, states that, and I give the quotation, if we are to truly honor and respect the personality of Jesus and live out the implications of his life, death, and teachings, we can no longer make claims about the absolute uniqueness of Jesus in the divine sense of the word, or the necessity of the encounter with the person of Christ for human liberation and salvation. To be true to the person of Jesus, his life of love and concern for other persons, his openness to persons of both sexes, of all economic classes, all cultural backgrounds. We must repudiate a Christology that measures the worth of persons on the basis of the relationship with Christ alone. In other words, we accept Christ as a human being, as a prophet of God. Now, on that point, and this is something which the Anglican Church have basically been debating. In fact, if, if I may give a quotation, and this is what the Archbishop Rowan, Rowan Williams, in fact, in an interfaith dialogue, uh, we were in fact discussing on the particular point insofar as what it means to be a Christian, or what's the defining factor of being a Christian. He says, there are just three conditions for being a Christian, and if we have to accept these three conditions, then these salient divisions between Islam and Christianity will fall away. In other words, you can still be a Christian, except the <coughs> Bible, Muslims accept their particular view, but it creates commonality between us. And this is what the, uh, the, the Anglican Church has done in London. 
They stated that the basic conditions for being a Christian are as follows, which was amplified uh, in the book The Final, uh, the Final Imperative, uh, A Theology of Liberation, where if you look at the liberation theology, that's another point. But these are the three points. He says to be a Christian, one needs to believe in the existence of God, a uniquely perfect transcendent being. I have no problem with that. Secondly, acceptance of the ethical and religious authority and leadership of the historical personage of Jesus of Nazareth. And thirdly, a commitment to viewing the life of Jesus. And this is quite important. This is what the Anglican Church basically indicates, or certainly what one would call the so-called liberal branch. In, uh, particularly the third criteria, a commitment to viewing the life of Jesus as a disclosure and human exemplification of the moral excellence of deity, such that the imitation of Jesus' behavior is already a moral action in the believer's life. On that point, the, 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 uh, uh, the discussion on this particular point was as follows, that on this particular condition, it makes a claim that is not equivalent to claiming a divinity of Jesus. It is not a doctrinal commitment of his nature. It deliberately leaves room for controversy over whether Jesus' ministry is an exclusive expression of God's manifest uh, wisdom and righteousness or merely a pivotal and a distinctive one. So the point is that on this particular issue is that if we are to accept that this is then or should be the essence of Christianity, then all else is simply a matter of exegesis. In other words, all that is simply that can be re reinterpreted. And if Christians accept this, then the major hurdles for theological distrust between Christians uh, by Muslims would obviously fall away. In fact, if, if you look at the uh, historical position, in fact, if you look at specifically, I'm not talking now about um, uh, what dogma, but the kind of second component, if you amplify this and take it to the second component of the Muslim theological distrust of Christianity, and that basically concerns the adoption by Christianity of a, a Hellenistic dualism of body. In other words, feeling and spirit, a dualism which we do not find in the Bible itself, but more specifically based upon St. Augustine's interpretation of Christianity. Much of Catholic and Protestant church life today uh, and policies based in a large sense, not strictly speaking on the teachings of Jesus, but in a large sense on St. Augustine's dualistic um, Neoplatonic worldview, where he divided humanity into two specific groups living in two cities created by two kinds of love. You read his book, Cities of God, and there he in fact quotes, and I give a quotation, um, the earthly city was created by self-love, reaching the point of contempt for God, the heavenly city by love of God carried as far as contempt of self. And what St. Augustine was concerned about was only with loyalty to God. For with that particular loyalty, what it would mean was that all else would fall into place. He thus told Christians to love God and you subsequently do what you want. And so you find, historically speaking, the kind of imperialistic nature of Christianity, which many modern day Christians would reject, and rightfully so, but that essentially took hold. For Muslims particularly, and this is a major problem pertaining to Christianity, is that Christianity in a sense appears to always choose secularism as it wills. And I'll give you a, a writing, is that, and that is that contemporary Western secularism is in a sense a product of the conflicts between science and Christianity that took place uh, during the 16th and 17th century. And then you had, of course, the Enlightenment period, um, where secularism dethroned the existing orthodoxy. They dethroned the existing church, the powerful institution of the church, and it gave rise to a vision of society that, in a sense, captivated the Western mind for the past 300 years. But contrary to popular belief, secularism on its own uh, did not, in a sense, cause a decline in religiosity. What it did was, is that, in a sense, it basically transferred religious devotion from the concerns of the church to the rational concerns of the existing world today. And so, since the Enlightenment, you find that this kind of religiosity has expressed its appearance in nationalism, in communism, in fascism, in scientism, in postmodernism, in, in every 
aspect, even in Marxism to a certain extent. And so in a sense, this grand narrative of secularism, which became the cornerstone of European imperialism, appropriated all, there was this cross-pollination between the church, the ruling orthodoxy, and the kind of new rationalism that basically evolved, that effectively developed. As it stands, Christianity should be an antithesis to, to secularism, yet it became tied to a particular culture. It became tied to a particular scholarly strand of uh, historic experience uh, of a particular people. And of course, instead of explaining the Bible and Jesus' ministry within changing circumstances, what it did was that uh, cultural settings and different languages, scripture and Jesus were made to serve the ends of European imperialism. And so you had, for example, the...